Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Married with Ataxia session. My name is Andrew Rosen, and I'm the Executive Director of NAF. Before we get underway with introducing our speakers, I want to mention a few housekeeping notes. Please remember to ask questions at any time. Just use the chat box you see below. We'll have our speakers available after the presentation to answer those questions. We will have a short survey at the end of the session and would appreciate it if you could take just one minute to give us your feedback. Also, if you are missing one of the talks happening at the same time as this one, don't worry. We will have all the sessions available for on-demand viewing at the end of the day. Check the video on demand link on the side navigation of the event platform. And now I'd like to introduce our speakers. First, we have Chuck and Andy Mitchell of Hendersonville, Tennessee, who have been married for almost 24 years. They have an 18-year-old son, Cade, who is a senior in high school. Chuck was diagnosed with SCA2 in 2006 after knowing there was a family history of SCA2. As a family, they enjoy beach trips, spending time with friends and family, and sporting events, all when COVID-19 will allow. Next, we have Jeanette and Matt Viveros, who were married in 2015 after dating for five years. Jeanette has SCA3. They enjoy wine tastings and binge watching TV shows. They live in Massachusetts with their dog, Teddy. And last, but certainly not least, we have Dana and John Morrow, who were married in 1990, in 1988, excuse me. After 18 years of marriage, John was diagnosed with ataxia. Life didn't end. They still enjoy traveling, camping, and outdoor activities. Over the years, they've become more involved with the ataxia community. Dana hosts the well-known Did You Know podcast on ataxia and is a support group leader. John is also a support group leader and currently sits on the executive board of directors of NAF. Welcome you all, take it away. Hi, my name is Jeanette Viveros and this is my husband, Matt. We live in Swansea, Massachusetts. Um, we've been married for five years and I have SCA 3. Um, pretty much from the start of us dating 10 years ago, um, my progression has started. So it's, a, it's always been known that I've had this condition. And my progression is continuously getting worse um, with the use of So Jeanette, um, mm -hmm. you know, over the last 10 years, you know, when we, we've known each other a little longer than that, but we started dating about 10 years ago and, mm -hmm. you know, we would see little symptoms from time to time where she would, um, you know, where she would stumble or she would have, you know, more trouble with high heels, um, you know, which has progressed over time to the point where now, you know, she might require a, uh, a walker, um, you know, to get around the house or out in public. Um, you know, when we, one of the best things that we've done for, you know, kind of getting around is that she has a scooter uh, that we use, you know, which certainly has given her some of her independence. Um, you know, Jeanette is a very uh, independent minded person. So, you know, when we're dealing with you know, household activities and such, um, you know, I, I want her to, to maintain some of that independence, but, you know, it can be a challenge, um, you know, for her to obviously do some of the, you know, just household stuff that we all have to do, um, you know, but it, it, I think it's important that, you know, I give her, you know, I, I can't always just do stuff for her, you know, I think it's important that she keeps, you know, doing some of those things and, um, you know, that she enjoys and, uh, one of the things I always struggle with just generally is, um, you know, is uh, being patient. Uh, I'm not patient by nature. So, um, you know, Jeanette's ataxia certainly, you know, forced me to, uh, you know, to look at myself and say, you know, you have to be patient in certain uh, circumstances. And, 
you know, it's going to take her a little longer to do something. Um, but I think it's important that, you know, when she, while she still can, that she does some of those things, you know, whether it's, you know, I, I often cook and she often does the dishes, um, you know, but when she does want to cook, you know, I sometimes find myself like hovering around, uh, you know, like uh, making sure she doesn't fall at the stove or, you know, if she has to, you know, dump the pasta water, you know, how do, you know, how does she do that? Or do I help her do that? So, you know, we work on a lot of that stuff together and, um, you know, it, it certainly is, it, it can test your patients. Um, uh, you know, I, I sometimes say that Jeanette has a, another uh, chronic condition, which is uh, tardiness. Uh, she's, uh, she's often, she was often late prior to uh, being diagnosed with ataxia. Um, mm. And now that's probably gotten a little bit worse. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, we do our best and try to keep, you know, just try to keep on a schedule and, um, you know, and, and do the best that we can. Um, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, what we deal with, I think, is, you know, is kind of processing emotions and how you you know, how do you deal with, uh, you know, the disease and how that can affect, you know, a relationship. Um, I think relationships can be hard, you know, when people are healthy. So when there's something thrown in that can certainly, um, you know, it can, can raise the, the pressure that's, you know, on a relationship or on one, one, uh, one spouse or on the other. Um, you know, I know for a time, I think, um, you know, Jeanette felt sort of a sense of guilt, you know, that she was somehow like preventing me from, you know, from doing certain things in my life. But, you know, that's never something that I really have ever felt. I never thought, you know, I can't do this, you know, because of my wife. I mean, you know, obviously, sometimes we have to find, you know, a different way of doing something or an accommodation. Um, you know, I, we have a, a supportive group of friends and family you know, that, you know, that do whatever they can to, you know, to keep us involved in activities or, you know, whether we go away somewhere, it's, you know, well, we have to find a, a house that, you know, is going to be accommodating, you know, is there a first floor bedroom? Is there a ramp? Is, you know, whatever the case may be. So, you know, that's, that's good. And I think that's important, um, you know, because I think, uh, you know, I worry about, you know, Jeanette's mental health and, you know, whether she's, you know, doing okay, and, you know, whether she's happy, or, you know, or, or depressed, I mean, I think we have to worry about those things, um, you know, because it can be tough, uh, I would imagine, um, you know, just dealing with this every day, and, and, you know, and how that's affected, you know, everything that she does. Um, we don't have children, we, you know, once we got together, and we got married five years ago, um, you know, we talked about having children. We knew that um, if we were going to, that we wanted to, um, you know, do uh, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, uh, you know, so that we wouldn't, um, you know, pass the, the disease on. Um, we did a couple of rounds of IVF with that. And unfortunately, we, um, she didn't get pregnant, but, you know, I think we've sort of accepted that that's, um, you know, that's the situation. And, you know, we're, we're very happy, you know, together. So I think that's, um, you know, for us that, that, you know, I think we've made the right decision to try it the way that we did. And, um, you know, I know that won't be everyone's decision and people find out at different times in their life. And, you know, that can bring on a whole other set of, you know, things that they have to deal with. But, um, we do have a dog. Um, his name is Teddy. Um, and we, we do enjoy spending time with him. Um, you know, just sort of a couple of, of you know, quick kind of anecdotes. Um, you know, I think probably good advice for anyone who's married. Um, and this is something that, uh, that Jeanette uh, kind of taught me is that, you know, I think as a, as a guy, I, I I want to try to solve problems. You know, if she's having an issue, I want to try to, well, I can do this or I can do that. And I think a lot of times, uh, you know, what she says is that, you know, she doesn't want me to, to get her out of the hole, 
she wants me to get in the hole with her. So I, I know what it's like to be in the hole. So that's a challenge uh, for me. But, you know, I think since I've sort of appreciated that, you know, uh, understanding how she's feeling, you know, has been important for our relationship and, you know, how we get along. And, um, you know, we're fortunate. We, I think we really like each other. So that helps, you know, sort of make everything a little easier. We get along well. We have common interests, um, you know, uh, I'm sort of a homebody by nature. So that's a positive thing, um, you know, where we can sit for a few hours and watch TV or, you know, recently we started playing chess. So we'll play chess against each other. Um, you know, Jeanette's very competitive. So that's a good, um, you know, it's a good activity so far for us, um, you know, not too much arguing over that um and uh one thing that i i say that we always do and it's important and it, i i sort of got this from my parents but you know we you know we like any couple you know whether you have a taxi or you don't have a taxi I'm, you know, I'm sure there's disagreements there's arguments there's fights um you know we always you know we kind of put those fights away and we always go to bed and we always share the same bed and I never get kicked to the couch. Um, and, you know, before we go to sleep, we always, you know, we give each other three kisses. We say that we love each other. And, you know, every day we just try to work toward, um, you know, making a good relationship and, you know, and being there to support each other, you know, whether it's, you know, physically or emotionally, um, you know, and, and we've had good success with that so far. And I'm, you know, I'm uh, looking forward to, you know, we've been married five years. I'm looking forward to the next five years and uh, and to see what that brings. So uh, I guess what I would say is it's, uh, I think being married is tough, whether you have a taxi or not. Um, but, um, you know, if you try to understand your partner, try to be supportive of them, you know, I think you can, uh, you can be very happy um, you know, being married with a taxi. Agreed. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Hi, everyone. We're the Mitchells. I'm Andy. I'm Chuck. And we live in Hendersonville, Tennessee, just north of Nashville, Tennessee. Our story together begins back in 1993. We met at a small college called Fried Hardeman in West Tennessee. We started dating a year later in 1994 got married in 97, so we're coming up on 24 years of marriage in July. Um, so I was going to turn it over to Chuck for a minute for him to tell you a little bit about his story. I, I guess it all started when I was 35. I started feeling a little bit different, and my, my family history at that time went from one one sex to the other, one generation to the other. So I I thought I have no no chance of uh, catching it. So it, it was it was kind of a shock when I found out that I do have it. And Chuck has SCA2 or spinocerebellar ataxia type two. And when we met and started dating, we did know at the time that uh, his dad had a condition, but nobody talked about it. It just seemed taboo. And as Chuck mentioned, they only thought it went male to female. And so he, we just kind of dismissed that. But the longer we were married and we had a child, who Cade, who's 18 and a senior in high school now, can't believe that. When he came along, uh, I just decided that it really wasn't enough. We needed to acknowledge what was going on. So living close to Nashville, I was fortunate to be able to get his dad in to see a neurologist, Dr. Hedera with Vanderbilt University. We took his dad and then a couple of days after that visit, Chuck got really quiet, which wasn't like him at the time, especially. And I asked him what was wrong. And he told me that he thought he needed to be tested for ataxia. And so we, we scheduled that test, the, the actual physical test, the blood test. And at that time, um, it was 2006, I think, right, Chuck, when, when you were diagnosed? Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, so he did the baseline MRI and the blood test took about a, a, a month to hear from at that time. So there's that, that whole period of anticipation and, and just, uh, just wonder. And then we did find out that he did have it. And so immediately our minds started going to, well, what if our son inherited it? So our son was four at the time. And as you guys may know, unless you're symptomatic due to ethical reasons, they won't test someone for ataxia until they're 18. And our son turned 18 on September 24th of just this past year, 2020. And he wanted to be tested the day after. And he was, and uh, very fortunately, we found out he did not inherit the ataxia gene. So we're so very grateful for that. And yet we're still uh, committed to fighting this fight for Chuck and so many of his family, so many uh, people that we've met through the NAF to continue to fight um, for research for ataxia, for awareness for ataxia too. Um, I'm an elementary school principal, so one of the things that I think our um, married life has gone through is a change, a shift of from being a two-income family to a one-income family, and I know I wrestle with a lot of guilt about how many hours my job takes me away and keeps me busy, but um, one of the things that Chuck and I talked about back in was it 2013 when you had to go on disability yeah back in 2013 was that uh, at least he could be here with our son to 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 be there pick him up from school take him to school be there for him when i was at work and so it's that part we've tried to be a team and remain a team about um about that um so because it's a big adjustment i think that when there's a diagnosis of ataxia or any kind of disease for that matter, there's almost a period of grieving, wouldn't you say, yeah. Chuck? And grieving is not just for death, as we all know. Grieving is for a change in lifestyle, a change of hopes and dreams, a, a change of, of things, just life not being the way that we pictured it. But we come to a point of acceptance and we don't stay in that period of grief. We can't do that. We made that decision a long time ago not to do that. Um, there were tears, there, there have been prayers and continue to be prayers, but we have a very um, faithful family. Uh, we have really good friends and a community that's strong. And so we really try to cling to that and, and embrace that too, because mm -hmm. you just can't stay in that, that grief mindset. You gotta kick it into action. And um, Chuck is definitely a person of action. You wanna tell him some of the things that you like to do? Uh -huh. I, I, I try to stay active. I ride a bike five days a week for about five miles a day. And I, I try to stay active because my doctors told me if you don't use it, you will lose it. I, I continue to do what I can. And, you know, even though I cannot do some things I used to do, but and it's important in marriage to, to do what you can and, and live your life and not be defined by the disorder. And he does a really good job of that. I'll have to give him a lot of credit. One of the things I think that being married with the taxia can do sometimes is um, for the, for the spouse um, of the one who's married to the ataxia, and sometimes there's the tendency to think, okay, that's just the ataxia, or that's just this, and try to overlook it, but we're human, and we have to start to separate out what's the ataxia versus, and you might not know this just from looking at him, but Chuck has ADHD pretty, pretty badly too, so what's that, or versus what is just is he just being a jerk right now? Am I just being a jerk? And I think we have to be honest and open. We love to laugh with each other and cut up with each other, but we do argue and we do fight a lot, just like any other couple, a taxia or not. Now he'd like to tell you that I like to fight more than he does, but it's really not true. Is that Chuck? Well, whatever you say. <laughs> yeah, I guess I'll hear about that later too, but um, one of the things that we found out last year about, about this time last year when, at one of his visits is that Chuck couldn't drive anymore um, due to the, the progression of the disorder. So that was a blow, I think, 
to him in some ways, but um, we've also tried to turn that around to a positive that our son can drive. And, and it's been great for Chuck to be able to impart his wisdom about driving to our son. And um, so again, it's people call me Pollyanna sometimes. That's okay. I think in 2020 and 2021, uh, we may need more Pollyanna in the world, and that's 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 all right. I'm trying to always look for um, look for the bright side of those situations. But uh, one of the things that we love to do is to travel, and the pandemic has definitely cut into that for sure. But hopefully soon we'll be back on the road to where we can do that. Um, our favorite place to go is where Chuck. Cool shores. Yeah, Gulf Shores, the beach, we've been on a few cruises. And one of the things that I've seen more and more throughout the years of, of progression with Ataxia is how much you have to advocate for yourself. How, many, how much you have to look into places and say, you know, do you have beach wheelchairs available? Do you have the, the tarps that allow you to walk down to the beach more easily? And, and it's been really neat to develop some relationships like that and to um, encourage people to, to think outside the box and to reach a bigger audience and, and then to in turn be able to share that information with other Ataxians and their families too so that they can enjoy travel. We've taken cruises, we've, we've gone to lots of tropical places and we're getting ready hopefully to do that again when uh, when COVID will allow and when um, when uh, we can we can work that out. Um, but one, one of the times that we went to the beach not too long ago, there was a little misunderstanding with somebody else that saw his beach wheelchair, his motorized beach wheelchair that we had rented, and they decided they might like to take that one for a joy ride. So there was a whole story there that we could tell um, about a, a police chase that ensued over a, a motorized wheelchair. But it, I, I have a better one than that. We meant to just my to Jamaica and I somebody didn't take my clothes. And I have one one suit and one pair of shorts to wear for an entire week and in Jamaica. Yeah, I, I still get blamed for that, although the clothes are right there by the suitcase. But he made it for a week on a cruise ship with a suit and and a, some swim trunks. That that we made it fine on that. But I think it's just continuing to be an open book with each other, uh, being honest when we're having those down days and um, being open book with, with family and friends and with our community as well and how, how much they embrace um, that and they're eager to know more about the condition. And, and it's been a beautiful thing to watch this whole shift in if his family has to have this disorder, seeing them go from not talking about it at all, don't even know what it's called, to now working with the National Ataxia Foundation, working with local support groups to try to get more information out there into the hands of people so that you understand, you know, our story may be different from everybody else's story, but there's so many similarities. And I think that's what's so important is just sharing your story, sharing of yourself, staying positive, just looking for the good in every day. Every day is not moonlight and roses, but what marriage is. Um, but it's about just being there for each other and remembering what it was that drew you to each other in the first place. What would, what would you say about that, Chuck? Yeah, yeah. I mean, when we first met in 1990. Three, I would have never dreamed this ever happened. But, you know, this is what life has dealt us. And we have to go on and live our life and continue to do the things that we do. One of the uh, biggest accomplishments to me was when my son found out he was negative because. Uh, I looked at myself like, if I can keep this to myself and don't pass it to anybody else, it'll, it'll be over. And that is the case now. I've always loved that Chuck has thought that, that he said his life would be a success if, if uh, he'll count his life a success if, if 
if it stopped with him. And to me, yeah. that shows his selfless spirit. And I, I do love and admire that about him. So we're looking forward to our son graduating from high school in May. He is our only child. We made the decision after we found out about Chuck's um, ataxia to not have any more children. Uh, and I think that's a very personal decision that every couple has to think about and, um, and make the best decision possible for you. And that's where that information is so key and so critical. But we're looking forward to that graduation and seeing what's ahead for his life and where we, how we fit into that too. But um, thank you so much for sharing this time with us today. We'll look forward to answering any questions you have later. Uh, like I said, we're pretty much an open book. So, and if you get a chance on April 24th to come down to Hendersonville, Tennessee, we're having the Country Skies Extreme Hike for Ataxia. Uh, I think you'll hear more information about that throughout the conference and uh, through your support groups and on web pages. But thank you so much for having us and stay strong, everybody. Thanks, Andy and Chuck. So um, I guess we're the last to go, hun. Oh. So this, <laughs> my name is Dana Morrow and this is my husband, John. And we were married for about 18 years before our ataxia entered into our relationship. And it entered in a really bizarre way. I mean, you had surgery for an umbilical cord hernia. And when he got up from the surgery, the nurse said to me, you know, I'm just going to walk him to the restroom. And after that, you can take him home. And then she came back over to me and she said, is he disabled? And I said, he wasn't when I brought him in here. But that's really, that started our journey with ataxia. He had really a lot of difficulty walking after that surgery and um, just started showing signs of ataxia. And they referred us to a neurologist and we just were going from there. It took two years though, before we actually got the diagnosis. Yeah, and then over the journey, it was the stress of trying to find out what you were diagnosed with and that road can be very challenging and it puts stress on the uh, family trying to find out what you have and it's constantly changing and then other things that change is the progression of having ataxia and so what we had done for the prior 18 years would have to be changed as we go forward as a Simple thing of leaning in and, and giving a kiss. It was, uh, that's not a smooth landing for a person with ataxia. <laughs> As we discovered. So, and I think communication is one of the big things. It is one of the big things. And, you know, in any relationship, communication is huge. But I think it's especially important in a situation like ours. Um, I really have to bring to John's attention different things that I'm noticing and he has to either confirm those or, you know, tell me I'm just being a, you know, crazy wife. But, um, you know, there are, there are times when, you know, I notice something and I just need to call it out to him. So we really have had, we, we've really gotten a lot better with our communication. And we talk a lot about what's going on, the different changes that I see, the different changes that he sees and what can we do about it it's it's almost like strategizing and coming up with a plan and taking it one day at a time really it is and, it, and it's something that uh, the person having ataxia they also have to deal with always hearing everybody in, around you say i'll do that for you i'll do that for you i'll do this for you and you you, you get angry and yet you don't know how to tell those people that you want to do it. It's going to take you a little bit longer, but you need to do it. And if you, if I needed help, then I would ask help. And that was one of the things that we learned over. It took us maybe seven years of difficulty of understanding, but we made a rule that, you know what, let me do it. If I need help, I won't be proud. I will ask for help. Yeah. And I think that's what took us a long time to come to consensus on because you have a very strong personality and you're very determined anyway and headstrong. So like that part came easy. The part that was difficult was knowing, you know, having you ask for that help, right? It, I think you had to develop a comfort level over time to ask me to help you with something. So now I just sit back and I watch and I wait 
<laughs> it's like a little game. And um, because I know that now you're going to say, you know what, can you help me with this? Or I really need your help. Yeah, no, I yeah. think that's a big thing. And then not just being married, you know, you have to deal with your, your kids, if your children, your siblings, you know, and your outside family. So you're at events and you might be explaining how, you know, the things that are happening to me, to my mother, to my father, my sister, whoever. And they say, yeah, 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 until they actually come over and people forget sometimes. And I think that that's also an eye awakening too. Yeah, it is. Because unless you're living with it, you don't really know what's going on. And you think that you understand until you actually witness it. And then you're, it, it can be very unnerving and scary. And that happened to us at a family cookout. John used to have these episodes where he would just use up all his energy and then he would have to lay down and sometimes he would just pass right out and this happened at a family cookout so he had said to me he was cooking on the grill and he had said to me I am I am gonna go down and he's like but I'll finish cooking for us and I'm like <laughs> all right and so sure enough he finished cooking and then he went down on the ground and I gathered everybody to eat. I'm like, okay, everybody, let's eat. And they're all looking at me like I'm crazy. And I'm like, just, he's fine. Just leave him lay there. And they were just horrified by <laughs> that. And we were like, this is what happens, you know? So yeah, it, we've learned to laugh. We've really infused a lot of humor into the situation over the years. Over the years, you've become quite a, um, a comedian yes, where I, I never have. did. So, you know, your sayings, um, People with a taxi, we don't stop on a dime. And sometimes I'm coming in and all of a sudden she turns around, coming in hot, coming in and hot. And I'm like, so I'm trying to laugh, trying to coordinate walking. And I'm like, it's making me like worse. And I'm like, yeah, timing is always impeccable. It is. <laughs> and I do that as a test. I just have to always keep you on your toes. But you know what? I do think it's a stress mechanism. You know, when I get stressed, that's a release is to be funny or you know, if you're not laughing, you're crying. So that's kind of what happens. So, yeah, you the end? Uh... and uh, I also think that something we've learned that's really important that we would like to share with everybody is that not everything that you're experiencing or going through is related to the ataxia. You know, in the beginning, what we found was any little thing that would happen, we would say, oh, that must be part of the ataxia. And we wouldn't discuss it with our physician or our neurologist. And we found out over the years that there were several things going on that had nothing to do with the ataxia. They were kind of coexisting conditions. So we think that, you know, it's really important that if you're extremely tired, that you follow up with your neurologist about that. If you're noticing, you know, really having a lot of issues swallowing or problems with your eyes, don't just assume that all these things are part of the ataxia. Well, that brings up a good thing. Uh, the swallowing and the problem having swallowing. So you're having family functions or mm -hmm. we're sitting down as a family and we're eating and my kids are wondering why I'm not communicating with them. Well, I don't want to choke on my food because everything is the three swallows to get down. So I concentrate on eating and they take it or did take it as a I was just tuning them out. And so I had a drill in the head. You know what? When I'm eating, I'm not going to talk. So we can only do one or the other. So, <laughs> yeah, no, it's a re education for everybody in the family. And that's a really good point. You know, if you're a couple, that has to, you know, it affects the both of you. But when you have children, it affects the entire family. So during the communication, it's extremely important to get the kids involved in that and make sure that they are well aware of things that are going on and what the consequences of those things are. And also to kind of have a family plan, like if something is to yeah. happen and, you know, if dad gets hurt, like what is the plan? Like, especially if, you know, I'm not home, what do you need to do? Now our boys are older. Um, they were about I think they were like eight and 10 when he was first diagnosed with ataxia and they're now 26 and 24. So we're not dealing with young children anymore, but through this whole journey, we have really made sure that they were aware of everything and they were part of the solution and the, uh, and really the conversation. I think that's really important. 
Think, and I think, yeah, I think helpful. that's really what we wanted to share with you. So we hope that you found this helpful. We probably, um, you could identify with a lot of what we, what we have said. Um, and so, yeah, we just hope that you found it helpful. We enjoyed sharing our story with you. Yeah, thank you. And Thanks. everybody's not alone. Yeah, that's true. You're not alone. No. Definitely not alone. Right. Thank you.